Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, welcome to the Hochschule Luzern, to the School of uh, Art and Design. And we are the Design Management International Program. Uh, for the people listening that are not very familiar with Daniel, he is one of the catalysts of the regeneration and the author of Designing um, Regenerative Cultures, one of the books our students read. Uh, he works as a consultant. Uh, he grew up in Germany, studied biology, and is now in Mallorca. So the format that we have um, created is a conversation. So I'm going to be asking some questions to uh, Daniel, and he's going to be answering. And then some of our students are also going to be asking questions. Uh, I hope that sounds good. Sounds so great. Just before we start, very briefly, thank yes. you for in inviting me. And, and the, the two things to maybe add in terms of contextualizing my work within design, I, I did study biology to start with, but then I did a master's in holistic science, and that actually led me to doing a PhD in design. So um, I, I also have a design background just so that the students can connect with that. Yes, thank you. That's a very important point yeah. to highlight. My apologies. Um, so the first questions we have is, could you please explain what is regenerative design and how does it relate to innovation? Well, for me, it's important to drill a little bit into how we tend to think of design before we put the word regenerative in front of the word design. Um, because uh, for many people, thinking of designs predispose them of a deliverable, a finished product, a building, a, yeah, whatever, at some point you get a brief and then somebody give me this design and then you deliver the design uh, in, in, in a form of, of some form of object or even process. And the shift into regenerative is to see that, yes, we need to do this, but we need to contextualize the objects that we're designing within the wider context of life's regenerative capacity to create conditions conducive to life. How do we fit our designs and meet human needs through design in such a way into the local and global ecosystems that they don't interfere with the life support system that we ultimately depend on. And so um, regenerative design is in that sense, more a journey of learning how to do this than a way to give you a final outcome, a solution. Like yes, solutions and answers are important. And as designers, that's what we do. We enable people to create, innovate new solutions to, to complex problems. But the, again, zooming out of the, the mindset of working on problems, it leads to abstraction and then an abstract problem definition and then some sort of generalized solution that we then try to scale up and scale out to lots of people. Mm -hmm. and, and in that very pattern is again, something that isn't really truly regenerative because regenerative also, and there's another dimension of it, has to be engaging the capacity building of individuals and collectives in a particular place. And the solutions that you co-create, so, so get away from the great designer um, who becomes internationally famous as a competitive individual um, towards the designer as a facilitator of learning and capacity building in a particular place where both the designer and everybody who is touched by the design process and involved in the design process is actually transformed and, and creates new capacities while engaging in design. Sounds, sounds very complex, but it actually becomes simpler because the minute we work in this place sourced way, in this way of saying, yes, we need to fix these problems and these problems exist all over the world. But if we look at them from the unique conditions, culturally, ecologically, socially, 
of a particular place, then suddenly these problems become very specific and they become about unique people, unique teams, unique communities and unique ecosystems in a unique cultural context. And suddenly that allows us to flip from problem solving to manifesting potential because we're then suddenly looking at everything involving everybody and we're trying to use regenerative design as a, as a collective practice to manifest our individual and collective potential and importantly to do so in a place sourced way. So, so the place itself, not just the human beings and the literature and, and all our intellectual stuff, but actually the place itself, the, the story of place, the long history, the, 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 the previous inhabitants of place, the previous industries in that place, the previous ecosystems um, that existed in that place and, and the diversity of ecosystems and, and so on, all of that should, inform regenerative design and, and, and actually guide it. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. I will have a lot of follow-up questions, but otherwise we go out of <laughs> <laughs> what we agree and it will take more time. So <laughs> I can send you email with follow-up questions. Okay. So our second question is, innovation is considered for many organizations right now as a must. However, innovation is also partly responsible for the multiple crises we are living now. Uh, what will be your message for those people fostering innovation within organization? Well, one of the big buzzwords, maybe it's already on, on the way out, is this, this term disruptive innovation. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Clayton Christensen wrote the, wrote the book on that, um, where he distinguished between sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. And sustaining innovation is not sustainable innovation, it's su an innovation that sustains the existing system or the existing industry or technology to continue as, as the main prevalent um, structure. Mm -hmm. Disruptive innovation is when you disrupt that status quo with a new technology or something truly innovative that, that is so fundamentally different that the, the old business isn't gonna be viable in the long term. But, but we need to distinguish that disruptive innovation can also be captured by the status quo over the long term. So for example, you can disrupt the fossil fuel industry by innovating in the renewable energy space, but then the big fossil fuel industry or the energy industry can then capture wind power into large wind farms of mega turbines that are still centralized structures of power generation and not community de decentralized, diverse, locally adapted power systems. So, so suddenly you get a, a so-called disruptive innovation being captured by the status quo. And what, what we really also need is, is the transformative innovation to, to, to say, how do we actually begin the conversation that we say, not everything, but a large extent of the current business as usual is degenerative and exploitative to human beings and to nature and has no future. We're in a climate emergency, political leaders are not responding. COP26 was another talking shop and we will be pushed into a situation of having to respond to radical climate situations in the next three decades. And yeah. in order to build local capacity to do that, we need to involve everybody in this conversation about how do we redesign the human impact on Earth in a way that we shift from being exploitative and degenerative to being regenerative and healing. And I, I always remember Bill Reed from, from Regenesis Group um, saying to me once, you cannot heal the planet, you can only heal places. You cannot save the planet, you can only save places. And there's, there's deep wisdom in that, in the sense that once we all engage in local and bioregional ecosystems regeneration now, or, or re restoration, now we're at the beginning of the UN decade of ecosystem restoration, um, and we bring design into service of that, into, into service of creating more community cohesion, more bioregional, vibrant, diverse economies, then we can engage everybody, create 
more climate resilience for these bumpy decades ahead, but we can begin the process of actually restoring local ecosystems and regenerating the capacity of people in place to come back to being a regenerative culture, because that's another really important thing to when, when, when regenerative cultures are now beginning to be something that people talk about, they get talked about as if it's something new. Mm -hmm. It's something very ancient. 99% of our species history, we have been bioregionally focused regenerative cultures that lived as custodians of the ecosystems we depended upon. And on top of that, we didn't see ourselves as the owners of these ecosystems. We saw ourselves as expressions of those ecosystems, mm -hmm. healers, keystone species, co-creators with the rest of the community of life. And it's only in the last five to 8,000 years, which we, we call history, but in the story of life or the story of our species, that's a very short period of time. And in that period, we have taken a detour where we're designing against nature. We're actually defuturing rather than futuring through design. And now we need to bring indigenous knowledge, like the, the wisdom of indigenous knowledge, how to be a regenerative culture into the 21st century. And that's a design challenge. Good, a design challenge we are going to take and embark in. One of the key words that you use is engagement, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this relates to the next question. What does it take to design a conversation for cultural change? The cultural change that you are talking about. And um, could you share an example with us? Well, when I was writing my book, I very early on, and I share this story often um, because it's central to the evolution of the book, um, had a, um, not really a writer's block. I was still working on the structure of the book and asked myself the question, what are the design solutions and practices and, and, and um, best processes that I can outline in this book in a way that the book would be meaningful in 10 or 20 or 30 years time. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, I, it, it just brought me back to some other work I've done where we kept circling back to this wonderful Rilke quote of living the questions. And I began to realize that, that in, in this quote, Rainer Maria Rilke says, du musst die Fragen leben. You, you have to live the questions because you can't necessarily answer them already because they're written in, in books that you might not understand yet. Only if you live deeply into the questions, maybe one day you will arrive with the answers. And, and that sort of inspired me to, to really reflect on the fact that throughout the history of humanity, people have always designed solutions most of the time with the best of intentions for the betterment of humanity. And very often these solutions worked for a while and then turned into the next generation's problems. And we're now realizing that the entire design of an industrial growth society and an exploitative capitalist economy was a pretty disastrous thing to do to a biosphere and really also to our species. And so now we, we, we're needing to engage this conversation of how do we redesign? How do we, and, and to do so, is more through living the questions than to forcing solutions and answers on people. And that brings me to, to, to your question that the minute you want to engage a design-led conversation, if you do it through questions and you involve everybody across sectors and, and societal divides with the uniting element of place, we live here together and we will have to go through these the, the coming decades of climate change and and systems change ultimately um, in this place together and and suddenly everybody's involved and if you do it if you set a space where we where you come in with the humility of let's live the questions together rather than battle over the right answers and solutions all the time which doesn't mean answers and solutions aren't welcome, but hold them lightly and let other people offer their answers and solutions. And let's collectively build more awareness of what the, the, the potential solutions are, and then explore whether the place itself 
wants these solutions to root in this place and which ones would fit that place and that culture. And so suddenly, what might be inspiring examples of, ah, I've seen people do this in this part of the world and there's a project in another city, why don't we? becomes an inspiration, but it becomes then something that inspires a local question-based conversation about how could we do this meaningfully here? And, and everything we finally implement is done with the humility that it's a prototype, that mm -hmm. context will change. And at some point, our design, no matter how regenerative we intended it to be, will fall out of fit with the transformed context. And then we need to be ready and have the capacity to adapt again. And that's the shift in what is regenerative development. It's about building the capacity of people to journey into a regenerative future and less so about fixing specific designs. Can you provide an example? How can we build people's capacity? How do we engage them and how do we bring them on, on board to develop this capacity? Well, there are in, in my book a number of, of tools or processes that can be used to begin that conversation. So for example, there's a, there's a model that I sort of spoke about earlier when I was um, speaking about um, innovation, which is the three horizons. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this model, which was developed by, uh, by friends of mine in the International Futures Forum, and there's a wonderful book by Bill Sharp called Three Horizons, A Patterning of Hope, that very succinctly describes the, the use of this model. It's a way of um, bringing different perspectives on the present and the future into the room around a partic particular theme. It could be the future of Lucerne and the Lucerne, Lake Lucerne and, and the bioregion, all the aquifers feeding into Lake Lucerne, to give you an example. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you um, engage in how would we improve the e local ecosystems of this region? How would we re-regionalize production and consumption, support local producers in new ways, create new businesses that grow biomaterials regionally that we can then have um, as, as the, the, the resources of unique local enterprises that support the bioregion in a regenerative way and do so in ways that engage community, create employment, work with university and innovation and all of that. That's an interesting vision, um, but you would have very different actors in the system coming together and have a different approach to how that could play out. And the three horizons can bring these different perspectives that will definitely be there, like the, the manager and the politician who needs to make sure that the lights stay on and that people stay in school and that there's no revolution and people are in, in employment. The, these are all valid concerns uh -huh. um, towards the visionary who says the current system is broken, we need to transform the system and create something completely else. There's truth to that too. And how do we bring both of them into the same room? Well, the, the innovators horizon, the second horizon, um, are the, the entrepreneurs, the, the, the people who are already trying to do the new within the context of the current system. And by using the three horizons as a day-long activity of mapping out the future on a specific sub subject, like the bioregion around Lucerne, uh -huh, um, is in itself a process that, that, that might not lead to everybody agreeing at the end of the day, but it, as Bill Sharps likes to say, it leads to people agreeing more intelligently mm -hmm. and to collectively be able to have wiser decisions because we've heard different perspectives. And, and, and all of that is, is ultimately facilitated by many of the tools that people learn in design schools. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's it. Now we design conversations. So that's a, a new thing that we design. Um, the fact that you mentioned living with questions, that's very beautiful. Um, Francisco Varela also mentioned something similar that you have to dare to, to live with that question for, for a while, because you might not have an immediate answer and you might not be able 
um, to answer in, in the time frame that you think. So maybe that's a question that someone else will be answering. Um, like for, for example, when you ask me, what is regenerative design? Rather than pretending that I want to answer from the space of an expert in regenerative design because I wrote a book on something regenerative, I would much rather answer, well, that's a really good question. And let's go on the journey to find out what a truly regenerative design would be because I don't really know yet. Uh, and, and it's that humility in our approach, which of course flies in the face of trying to sell your services as a designer in a mm -hmm. competitive market industry. So you have to somehow find a humble yet convincing way of, of, of engaging your, your potential clients. Uh -huh. But I, I find in all of this, like there are so many conversations now um, where people run seminars on regenerative tourism or regenerative fashion. Or, and I, I just feel like, could you not do something very, very similar, but much more powerfully if you phrased this as a question and invited people into an exploration mm -hmm. rather than felt the need that you now need to produce a PowerPoint that tells everybody, oh, I know what regenerative design is, because the very fact of, of pretending to do so almost takes the ground you're standing on away. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and there might be also different approaches and different interpretation. So yeah, yeah uh, not, not only one. So yeah. that, that's also a good point. And I think that's very good for the students to hear. So maybe they will start now thinking about, okay, how can they answer this uh, as future uh, designers? And, um, and briefly, like if they ask that question, it's what would a regenerative design do? A regenerative design would always try to serve the next larger context to engage people in a process of capacity building of, and, and learning to bring out, put the potential in people in place. So it, it wouldn't just be, uh, we need this to look better, make it pretty. Uh, mm -hmm. The classic misconception of design as beautification of material objects. Uh, it's so much more than that. How would it, how would anybody touching, uh, touched by this design somehow be transformed or asked to question more deeply? Uh, anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's go for our next question, and then I will invite the first year students that have prepared some questions. Uh, so how do we educate designers for regenerative design? Um, I would try to answer some of these other issues. The holy grails that you hear in the halls of academia quite often are um, transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, knowledge transfer away from the ivory tower, um, all of those things, uh, um, community engagement. Um, I would invite regenerative designers of the future into this humble process of community engagement of how can we be of service mm -hmm. to the larger context we live in. And that's place. That's you can and place is fractal. It can be the building you're sitting in. Uh, um, it can be the, the neighborhood of the school. It can be the whole of the town of Lucerne or the bioregion. But but by engaging with the specificity of place and engaging with real people to to solve um, or not even solve problems, but to 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 use the power of design to help people re-envision their role in creating a regenerative culture. And this is, this is a wonderfully creative invitation. This is reaching out to the artists, the musicians, the dancers, the poets, just as much as to the scientists and the graphic designers and, um, and, and the social media experts. It's being innovative of how do we design conversations? How, uh, what, what interventions, whether it's through objects like art and design and, and, and graphic design and so on, or, um, or, or through performances or, or museums, um, there's so many cultural expressions and design has this capacity to be the DJ of mixing from all the disciplines and creating something new out of it. And how do we put that into service of 
inviting the place sourced question, how do we live regenerative in this place? We that we are here now, not the, the people who have 15 generations of Swiss background, but everybody here, including the immigrants. And, 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 and this is the same in every place. It's, it's saying we cannot save the planet, but we can come together to try our best to save this place. And how does design help that? Good. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, I will ask Andreas um, to ask his first question. Um, Julie, can you make yes. Andreas um, visible? Yes. There you go. And I will ask if there are some of the other first students. Um, hello, Andrea. Hello. Hello, Daniel. Hi. Hi. Uh, if there are other students that would like also to ask questions, uh, please send me a message. Otherwise, Andreas will be asking the questions for you. Okay. Um, our first question was, um, what's the difference between regenerative design and circular design? Is there, is there a difference or is it just... No, good, yeah. good, good question. Um, I would say that circular, anything to do with circular economy and so on, is, is speaking to a pattern, a subset of the wider regenerative patterns and ecosystems that, that, that have over millennia and, and, and the, the history of life on earth created conditions conducive to life. So, so, so nature's core pattern is circularity one one of nature's core patterns um but if you don't put that whole conversation about the circular economy into the context of how how does this circular economy help the healing the regenerating of local place and bioregional ecosystems then very quickly what what happens is that we look at circular in industrial processes at scales that, that aren't really truly regenerative. So what, what happened in the conversation around industrial ecology um, or, or what is now called the circular economy, it actually went through, through three distinct phases. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, it was called industrial ecology and there are wonderful books on that. And they highlight very specifically that one of the most effective ways of designing in this way is to make the, the loops, to close the loops as close to home as possible, local and bioregional. But then all that work got taken up and, and reworded to reach a larger audience by um, the chemist and the architect, Bill McDonough and Michael Browngard, um, under the, the heading Cradle to Cradle. And then that oh. went around the world and, and reached more people. But it, it was the same concepts of industrial ecology but with a slightly different spin on it, so to speak. And then wonderfully, Ellen MacArthur Foundation picked up Cradle to Cradle and rebranded it again as the circular economy and in that step really engaging large industries, which is wonderful and a necessary conversation. But what would now be really important is to remember the insights of the first industrial ecologists that, that to make the circular economy ideas really regenerative, we have to look at them as far as possible on the local and bioregional scale, but not in a black and white, we now need to radically re-regionalize all our production and consumption. If, if we tried to do that, we wouldn't be talking in this way very soon because of the, the, the elements that are in information technology and so on. We need to as designers and as in, in industrial designers and the, in the management of industrial processes, we need to very carefully look at what is the minimum 20, 25% of global resource trade that we need to maintain in order to enable radical re-regionalization processes in bioregions everywhere. So, so in every place on the planet, you you try to meet the needs of regional populations as regionally as possible through circular economies, building circular biomaterials economy in a shift away from um, mining altogether from using fossil materials as far as possible, which is a big 
innovation space in the biomaterials and fungi technologies and all those, like we can grow our material culture. We don't, don't need to mine it. But in the meantime of the next transition of 20, 30 years, we will need to continue mining. And it's exactly this, what are the necessarily global cycles and what are the potential much more regionalized and localized cycles that, that would make circular regenerative? Long answer, but a really important question. And I've, I've just put a few um, emails, uh, uh, um, medium articles into the chat. And this one here speaks to exactly that, that question um, of political oh, yeah. Yeah, There are, um, to everyone listening, three links in the chat uh, that Daniel has put mm -hmm. or share with us. Andreas, are you ready for the second question or would you like some of your uh, colleagues so you know if someone would like to ask a question or you go for it? No, that's okay. Um, as you mentioned, the industry, I would like to, to ask one question, which is um, one of the biggest factors to climate change and destruction of, of our ecosystem is the industry. So how do you think, is it possible to reach out to companies and industries and even more to lobbies? Mm -hmm. um, my experience is that over the last five, six years, that meme regenerative has become viral in the sense that companies are actually asking the question, the mistaken question, of what can regenerative do for us? And okay. our challenge is to pick them up on that interest and say, um, when you ask that question, you've already somehow not quite understood what this is about. Um, ask the question of what can we do to help the regeneration of our relationship with the living planet of this place, this community, this ecosystem. Um, and those companies that I'm in touch with that, that are exploring how they could tr transform towards having a regenerative impact, which is more than, like Carol Sanford, who is one of the, 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 the real um, sources of a lot of the, the frameworks behind um, regenerative development thinking and, and practice, um, speaks of four currently operative paradigms in, in modernity. One of them is extract value, which is the capitalist market economy, just get as much as you can quickly and, and sell. And the next one is saying, no, 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 that's creating far too much damage and we're having a revolution on our hands soon and climate change is a problem. So let's arrest this order. Let's, let's create stakeholder capitalism is moving a little bit beyond that. Then the next one is saying, no, no, none of this is enough. We've done so much damage, we need to do some good. And this is what often is misunderstood as being regenerative. But, but regenerative is really about capacity building to continuously journey into the future in a way that we heal local ecosystems in our communities. So it's, it's, it's about regenerating life as a dynamic process. And um, so uh, now I'm losing my track of what, uh, Coming back to your question, um, repeat, repeat your question again. Sorry, I, I, I um, about about how, how to how to influence or how, how to how to to reach out to companies and industries and mm -hmm. and uh, one, one one way that I found yeah that, thank you um, I, I sort of went on a detour with these four paradigms um, mm -hmm. and then lost the track of how to come back, but um, I find that simply by acknowledging that making regenerative a direction of travel and exploration rather than something that you now add where you used to put sustainable company eh, is already one way of engaging them. Then to, to invite them that they can't do this in the confines of their individual company. They have to do it even beyond that in, as an industry and in collaboration with policymakers and civil society. So it's always opening up more context and a wider picture for, for business to understand um, how to truly 
have a regenerative impact, how to touch everybody in their company and along their entire supply chain. And But, but one way to, to side with business leaders who have a difficult issue because they are, they're trying to shift in that into that paradigm, but the, the playing rules of the current market system are such that they actually disincentivize companies to put regenerative impact over um, short-term financial gain. And, and it's, it's that deeper conversation where we open up how the impact of that has social and healthcare costs and also economic costs in the long term and, and bring more actors, not just business, but civil society and public authority to the table around a particular place that, that can open up this conversation of how business can really be a regenerative force. And, and at the same time, the funnel is wide and, and um, there are many conversations now that are pretty shallow regarding what would a regenerative business look like, but they're at least beginning to be a conversation into this notion of shifting from away from just avoiding um, negative impact towards being regenerative and, and, and healing. So the, the article I just sent, um, would you, or have, I, have I sent it? Um, um, hold on, it's like this one here. Can regenerative economics and mainstream business mix is a, is a reflection um, that I wrote when I was asked to speak on this topic in, in London a couple of years ago. And, and that gives you also a framework that you can use to, like that, um, I'll just briefly share it on the screen here. Hold on a sec. Um, This image is a way of also engaging different actors because it, it puts the whole conversation around regenerative into the context of, um, of sustainability and, and the sustainable development goals. And since a lot of companies have um, signed up to the sustainable development goals, it, uh, hold on, like this, it's easier. Um, Rather than what, what's happening at the moment is that a lot of consultants who are jumping onto the regenerative bandwagon are selling regenerative as the next new thing that is replacing sustainable. And we're selling the new by depreciating the old and dismissing the old. So you can hear people say, oh, you're still working on sustainable or the SDGs, how old fashioned we're now doing regenerative. And, and that, that I think is not helping. Um, we need to frame the conversation around sustainability as a bridge that we haven't crossed yet. And the SDGs, as fallible as they might be to a certain extent, as an opportunity, as a platform for conversation, that, that actually address quite a lot of the complexity that we need to address. And then, but we also need to, that's, that's why I put a spanner on SDG number eight, because um, SDG number eight is the spanner in the works. We cannot have a regenerative future without rethinking our capitalist economic growth model. Um, yeah. The current way of measuring growth is mistaken. GDP is measuring negative impacts as well as positive impacts, and it's not a measure of progress or success. And so we, we need to um, address this systemic ecosystem, uh, economic change issue, as well as the companies changing, because for companies, it's like playing in a rigged playing field or hitting a glass ceiling in their aspirations to be regenerative if we don't shift towards, towards new ways of measuring progress. Anyway, I'll stop sharing now if I can. There we are. Right. Yeah, let's hope that, um, that for example, China and India do take that as well. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Um, We've got one last question, which is um, how does regenerative design involve the community more than others? Well, in a way I, I spoke to that already um, because it is through this uh, more hum like uh -huh. you, can, you can give a scientific 
framing of this, of saying we're, we're now dealing with the wicked problems of design, these problems that are so complex that, that almost any attempt to try to deal with them creates more problems somewhere else uh, because there's so many clusters of interconnected issues. And that is pushing us to finally assume an insight that comes from the complexity sciences that any complex dynamic system, which is any system with more than three interacting variables, so pretty much everything that we're dealing with, um, is mathematically fundamentally unpredictable and uncontrollable beyond very limited time and space frames. Which means that this whole idea that we can design final solutions or that we can force, predict a future and then implement it is a little bit not based on the best of, of our current science. We, we need to humbly acknowledge the limits of our knowing and uncertainty. And therefore, that's another reason why we need to design at smaller scales to, to get more feedback of the impact of our designs and why regional designs are more regenerative because you very quickly see if you're making a mistake and you're needing course corrections. And so, so this, um, this whole process of through living the questions and with humility and starting from not knowing and we need to explore this humbly together and we need to hold our final designs and solutions lightly it's the it's the exact opposite from the kind of gung-ho build a unicorn california style um entrepreneurship of just promising the blue we've got the solutions and we'll now scale it out and in, uh, in uh, scale it up and implement it everywhere. It's, it's, um, it's engaging people in this deeper conversation of how ultimately it's our worldview and value system change that is upstream from anything we design. And through living these deeper questions and asking these deeper questions, we can invite people into that space of saying like, um, could we ever possibly design a regenerative future if we continue to tell the story that nature and culture are somehow separate and that technology and nature are somehow separate or that we can replace fundamental life support systems by purely human technological solutions? Unlikely. So we, we need to heal this false narrative of humanity and nature being separate and and make our designs and the, the conversations we design center around how would we become expressions of place again? How would we express nature's capacity to be regenerative again? And, and to link it into our indigenous past as a species that has done this. We now have the science to show that the Amazon rainforest or the Pacific Northwest um, prime forest in, in, in Seattle and, and, and Vancouver. Those forests were created by human inhabitants that saw themselves as part of the ecosystem they lived in. Similarly, in Iberia, where I live in, in, in Spain, the, the oak forests of the Iberian Peninsula were, were forest gardens created by regenerative cultures that lived over millennia in place in ways that improved the abundance and productivity of the ecosystems they lived in. And we can do this again. And with modern science, we can do it in amazing ways. Um, and it's this, this humble embracing science, but with a very nuanced and critical perspective on how technology always is double-edged. It serves for something, but it also transforms our lives in ways that we don't necessarily foresee or intend. And to, and again, create design conversations that, that invite this question. What is the bit of this technology that we don't see that will shape our future in ways that we're currently not aware of? And really sit with that question for a while before we implement solutions. That, that's one of the many ways of how um, regenerative development practice is a community-based process of learning what the regenerative design might mean in a particular place. You, 
you even did mention this in in uh, in your book um like um that well you you, you made you made the comparison with, with with the evolution with with um with charles darwin mm -hmm. and um and what what the true well the true uh what what, what actually is, is fact it's it's not the survival of the fittest but it's it's like to be all together interdependent. Super. No, That's absolutely. That, that, thing, that, is, that is that core insight. When, when we understand that, then we see that our biological storytelling about life has been somewhat individualist and speciesist. Uh -huh. I mean, we, Darwin, and there's a lot of wisdom and ge genius in, in Darwin's theory of evolution, but, but it has been misrepresented as survival of the fittest rather than the most fitting, which is what Darwin actually sp spoke about. But it's also led us down this reductionist rabbit hole of not only looking at species and individuals and then genes as the unit of competition, um, instead of looking at it holistically as life as a planetary process, that from the very beginning, has created the conditions for more life to evolve. Like Janine Benyus from, from the Biomimicry Institute has, has nailed it to my mind. Like the whole institute is about biologically inspired design solutions and technologies. But her core summary of 20 years of learning from life's form, process, and systems design is that life creates conditions conducive to life. And, and it's, it's that um, understanding that, that aligns perfectly with the understanding of evolution as a process that is predominantly about collaboration and integrating more diversity at higher levels of complexity through new forms of collaborative practice. That's the long era of evolution. Um, Competition exists, but competition is the fine tuning on the surface. It's the ripples on the ocean, the waves, but the whole depth of the ocean is symbiosis and collaboration. Life could be described and is described by, by physicists to some extent as a local syntrophic force. Like there's the, the second law of thermodynamics, everything leading towards entropy in a small place like a planet in a vast solar system in a vast um, galaxy, for a few short millions of years, life reverses the trend towards entropy and actually creates syntropy, neg entropy. It creates more life, more bioproductivity. And, and that's our collective inheritance as Gaia, as a living biosphere. And we have squandered that inheritance, but our the shift towards regenerative cultures is to say, we now have the technologies to live regeneratively within this planet and bring it back to more biodiversity. Uh, by, well, it's difficult to bring biodiversity back. Life does that. But we can, we can um, be custodians of the existing biodiversity and bring diversity back to places we have um, made a lot less biodiverse. Um, and it's that kind of vision of how do we refit into um, life's evolutionary pattern that is at the core of regeneration. I, have, I, I encourage you all to, to look up, if you Google Fritjof Capra, Daniel Wahl, um, YouTube, I had a conversation with Fritjof Capra who wrote this wonderful book on the systems view of life and the science behind this living systems perspective. And in it, we, we agree that understanding life as a planetary process that is structured it as nested regenerative communities is probably the healthiest way of framing or scaffolding how we might fit back into this pattern and how we can actually regenerate it rather than destroy it. Excellent question. Thank you that you brought that up. Nice. Thank you, both of you. So if uh, someone, some of the participants have questions for Daniel, please um, go ahead. You can write them in the chat or let us know and we can uh, make you part of the conversation. And if you don't have a, a question, I will have more questions. 
And if I'm this evolution. Grace, Grace, would you like to um, Grace, Grace. Yes, please. Great. Grace, will you will you read it aloud? Yes, sure. Um, I was gonna say you could read it for me, but no, yeah. no. <laughs> Hi, Grace. Um, yes, my question was: How do you envision a food system that shifts away from like industrialized food and towards incorporating like regen regenerative design in the whole system? I mean, you explained it's very um, localized to the local culture and population but like more of like a general approach and how can you how right. can we create a more regenerative like system because now we are having food that's like imported from all over the world mm -hmm. instead of eating bioregional food and would like to know what is what is the opinion on this it's 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 a really important question there's actually a vast amount of global and different initiatives on regenerative food systems led by the UN and led by very large companies that are um, probably too big to ever be truly true players in, in a regenerative food system. But um, I think even before that, the Wendell Berry quote comes to mind. Wendell Berry said that, that um, we have a medical system that doesn't teach people about food and we have a food system that, that knows or pays no attention to health and those two are so closely linked and and also food and then i'm glad you bring this up because food in terms of we, we talked had two questions around how do we use regenerative development and design as a practice of engagement of community work food is the key into that conversation you can always engage people around food and particularly the connection of food in place, food and local farmers, the local food shed, where does this food come from? Um, and, and then link it to health and this, the existing science of how food that is imported over ten thousands of miles doesn't have the same nutritious value as locally grown food and food that is fresh, that has only been picked 24 hours, not um, a week ago, and then kept in specialized gas um, containers in order to make it stay fresh. Um, and, and also the, 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 the research that is already out there of the link between food and, and this is where, again, you, you will notice in the way I respond, I always feel it's important to open the bigger fractal of connection to people. So you can in working and designing around regenerative food system, invite people into realizing that neither you nor I are individuals, meaning there's only one being sitting there on your side of the screen and my side of the screen. You are an ecosystem and I am an ecosystem. There are more non-human cells in you and on you and in me and on me than there are human cells. So we, we are actually with our um, microbiome, our gut and mouth flora and our skin flora, we are walking ecosystems. And these ecosystems are closely affected by the food we eat. And, and so, and, and it, we're also realizing now that about 30% of the serotonin production of the human body comes through a healthy gut flora, which means that eating industrialized food actually shifts our reality perception because we were unhappy, we're de depressed and unhealthy because we don't produce, we don't even know anymore what it means to produce healthy level, levels of serotonin and, and kind of contentment inducing um, substances in our body. So, so you can see how this issue is, food is like a, an entry point into a fractal complex of, um, issues that are all related. It also connects through local farmers and local producers to um, local economies and generating local employment. Um, it, it creates through saying, we can't have a regenerative food system without having a regenerative water system and a regenerative soil system and regenerative agriculture. And so suddenly the conversation is even, even wider 
Um, so it, it's it's a it's a, a key entry point, and it's actually one of the spaces where a lot of work is being done. So if you, for example, look up um, Regeneration International, is an organization that is bringing agricultural, like regenerative agriculture players around the world, into this this conversation. Um, and yeah, I, I can send a couple of links to about food and, and regeneration. Excellent question. Yeah. Gracie is interested in, in food so, and, and farmers markets and things like that. So she will be um, very much interested in that. We have a question by Arnaldo um, Perez Garcia. Arnaldo has um, worked extensively doing research on obesity, childhood mm -hmm. obesity. Um, he's asking who should set the design agenda or agendas, plural? People in place together. Um, and the designers, like, first of all, we need to make this mental leap of understanding that design is human intentionality expressed through interactions and relationships. And that means that every one of us, whether we're trained as professional designers or not, make design decisions every day. And, and through that, we create more of a level playing field of inviting everybody into saying we are all designers, let's co-create a regenerative culture in this place. We can all do it together. But then of course there are trained designers that have a whole set of processes that can help this conversation, that help design these conversations of how can we um, be regenerative in this place. Um, and now I'm missing the link again. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's, it's getting late. Um, <laughs> but, it, it might come back. Yeah. But, so, yeah. The question was how uh, who set the design agenda? So yeah, and, and that that means that um, it really should be set aided by the designer, by the people affected both in the envisioning and the implementation and the creation and then the, the, the effect of the design, the final design. So it's deeply participatory. And um, ideally we need to invite our local authorities into this process to um, basically create design space, design-based conversations around these issues. Um, how do we create a design agenda? And and it's it's also, I know it's very difficult when you're starting out in the, any industry to be provocative or confrontational with the people that who might be your employers, who might be your client. But in my experience, one way to distinguish yourself from all the other people who are pitching for a job is to dare to tell your design client, before we even start, let's make sure you got the right brief. Is Are you asking me actually what you really want to do? Mm -hmm. Because too many designers just take the brief and, say, and go off and do as minions, ser service providers. But really your challenge is to make the person who sets the agenda, the client, think more deeply about the brief and 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 say basically if if i wanted to get there i wouldn't start from here uh, um like the or einstein's quote that i start my book with that if i had an hour to solve yeah. an issue that my life depended upon i would spend 55 minutes to get the question right that's a really good way of getting the person who's setting the de design agenda to stop breathe and reflect whether the brief is actually serving and, and that's one of the key challenges. Are we asking the right question? Yeah. Or are we asking a question that is um, not worthwhile? Yeah, there's a, Bayo Akumolafi puts it in this question, um, maybe the way we're responding to the crisis is part of the crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's a question that's to sit with. Yeah, yeah. We, we are on, on um, the hour. Mm -hmm. There is one more question in um, by Mabel. Um, okay, I didn't see the one of Nicolo. Um, would you, can you say some more minutes? Do, would you mind? Yeah, yeah, no problem. I, okay. I put, just very briefly, I put another piece on, which is called um, 
food and health um, into the chat. And now I'm just putting another one, which is called Redesigning Agriculture for Food so Sovereignty and Subsidiarity. I won't mm -hmm. go into Some, some readings for the students interested in the food and also some of the participants. And Mabel says, here are the two, are the other two questions I'm holding. How might we support the unfolding of sustainable climate resilient cities around the world? And how might we cultivate compassionate leaders while increasing community well-being? Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Uh, how long do we have? Um, just very briefly on the salutogenic, uh, like the whole issue of um, hold on a sec. Is this the right one? Yeah. Um, in general, any like there are about 450 articles on my Medium blog. So if you put any keyword, my name and Medium into a search engine, you'll probably get an article um, somehow or other. Um, and the issue of cities is massively important um, because they cause so much disproportionate amounts of the global impact environmentally and, and, and socially. And, and they're increasingly the mega cities are surrounded by basically um, economic refugees from climate change. Um, and so for me, one of the core ways of, of um, healing cities is uh, bringing them in close, into closer connection with their hinterland again. Um, basically, conceiving of cities in a bioregional context. The, the urban designer, the father of town planning, Sir Patrick Geddes, um, more than 100 years ago, wrote a book, Cities in Evolution, where he proposed the same thing, that you can't plan a town without going from the mountain ridge to the sea and the entire river system that the town sits on, which is basically a bioregional approach to urban planning. And um, I've, I've just put an article on, on salutogenic cities um, in, in the chat, and there's some, some links at the end of it or, that you can follow up more articles on, on urban design and regeneration. There's also a um, wonderful book by a friend of mine um, called Creating Regenerative Cities. He's, he's called uh, Herbert Girardet. Um, and um, let me see if I find the uh, conversation with him. Um, Hold on. Cities. Uh, and, and the other thing, conversation around leadership is, is huge. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure like, that there's so much to say about leadership that I almost feel I wouldn't do it justice going into this just last article on cities briefly here. Um, I think we need to, first of all, understand that leadership is a role and not a personality or like an individual. Like we, we peop, everybody can take leadership at a certain point in time and then step back and let other people take leadership. And um, bringing people into this realization that because we can't predict and control complex dynamic systems, we can't really design regenerative cultures. It's a paradox in the title of my book. We can only design in the intention of that our interventions create positive emergence in a system we can't predict and control. So it's a much more humble dance with complex system than an engineer's science and technology approach to a complex system. And that also has a consequence for how leadership is, is done um, because it needs to be informed by this paradox of on the one hand being much more humble in our not knowing and the unpredictability of it. And at the same time, being fully aware of the enormity of our agency that not a single one of us in this, on this call right now is not changing the future of the world. We're all changing the future all the time. And that means we need to pay attention to the future potential of the present moment 
and in everything we do, what we think, say, and how we act, hold this intention of being of service to a larger whole. And, th and then we can have a massive impact. And history is full of people who have changed the world because they held, held that vision. So it's, it's, for me, leadership is ideally also something that plants, memes, and seeds conversations and can celebrate that the people you seeded the conversation with own what comes out of it to the degree that they believe all the ideas were theirs and you weren't even involved in the process. So the best leader is the one who from the very beginning designs his or her interventions in such a way that they become unnecessary. The immature leader without doing so consciously constantly puts himself or herself into the center of the web they're weaving trying to do positive things, but if they pulled out, the web collapses. Um, so, and, and there's, there's a lovely book by, by Laura Storm and, and Giles Hutchins called Regenerative Leadership that is worth um, looking at. And again, if you put regenerative leadership, my name and medium into the search engine, you'll, you'll get a number of conversations that also should, maybe should, as well as the medium thing for those of you who prefer to just listen to a conversation, like more podcast style, um, I also have a channel on YouTube where I have conversations with people who are active in regenerative practice. So you can find conversations on regenerative cities or conversations with Giles Hutchins or Laura Storm on regenerative leadership. Great. Thank you very much. I have shared the link of your conversation with uh, Frishot Capra. Mm -hmm. And maybe that will take people to your YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. um, we need to close here. We need to let you go. It has been a lovely conversation. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. And I would like to, to, close with your, um, to close with your quote or sentence. Um, we have to be more humble in our ways of knowing and our not knowing. Um, I think that that's a very nice message for the students to take with, with them. How can we be more humble? Thank, Thank you. you very much. I really enjoyed this. Thank you very much, everybody. Great pressure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good evening. Bye.